Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the Dreaming and Fibre podcast by me, Sarah, of sarahstexturecrafts.com. I'm accompanied today by one of my little needle felted friends. Um, I thought the, uh, we're up in my office today and I thought the space was a bit um, blank, a bit bland. Um, all I've got to show you is probably what you can see behind me, which is uh, my wall chart for next year, which is looking quite crazy already. <laughs> so I thought I'd bring in my little friend here and he could um, sit with us while we enjoy today's show. So, okay, a few things to mention um, before we get into today's um, podcast. I um, First of all, I had a couple of people contact me about um, whether it was okay or not to leave iTunes reviews. Yes, by all means leave iTunes reviews for me. I'd be very grateful whether it's a star rating or a fully written um, review. Um, if you've got any serious um, sort of concerns or things that you dislike about the show, then contact me first and give me a chance to resolve those issues or put right any sort of um, concerns you might have before you leave me a review. Um, I think it's always fair to give um, podcasters a chance um, before uh, you you write something that might be negative in the same way that you would do for sales or book reviews or any of that kind of thing. Um, I know that um, a few fellow podcasters have suffered recently from some quite scathing um, reviews that seem almost unrelated once read back to the podcast in question and, and I want to try and avoid those almost spam comments if you like. Um, but please do, you know, just send me a PM if you find me on Ravelry or you can write direct to me through my main website sarahstexturecrafts.com or leave an iTunes rating um, or comment and, and I'd be happy to um, have them from you. Um, I'm quite happy to take constructive criticism and, um, you know, this is, this is a podcast I put out there for you as well as something I do purely for a personal reason. So, you know, let me know what you think. I'm quite happy with that. So thank you in advance. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was... Um, an email that I received from a lady called Cindy Moore. Now she is, um, she can be found at www.fitternitter.com and I'll just read her email to you. Uh, essentially she is asking us to take a look at the charity products that she produces. Um, I know that she's written to a number of other podcasters who've already mentioned over the last few months this particular cause on their podcasts and I thought, you know, why not go ahead and mention it here too. So I hope you don't mind if you've heard this several times before. But if you haven't, um, please pop over to um, her website and um, take a look at what she has on offer. So she wrote to me back um, at the beginning of October, just after I'd already um, put this podcast, um, episode 15 it was, out um, for the general public. So I thought I would mention it today. Calendar of Hope 2013. I really enjoy your podcast and hope you will please mention the Calendar of Hope on your podcast. It is our fifth year of publication and in that five years we have raised over $5,000 for breast cancer. The calendar contains 14 never before published knitting patterns. You can download one of the free knitting patterns at www.fitternitter.com to judge for yourself the quality of the calendar. All proceeds of the sales of these calendars, except for PayPal fees, go to www.armyofwomen.org, whose goals are to recruit one million healthy women of every age and ethnicity, including breast cancer survivors and women at high risk of the disease, to partner with breast cancer researchers and directly participate in the research that will eradicate breast cancer once and for all. They will also challenge the scientific community to expand its current focus to include breast cancer prevention research conducted on healthy women. We've come a long way in finding a cure for breast cancer, now let's find the cause. Thank you, Cindy Moore. So you can hop over to her website on www.fitternitter.com and she has um, the calendar up for sale. Um, I forget off the top of my head how much it was, but it's really it was really good value for 
the fact that you're getting 14 never before published patterns. Um, they are um, dishcloth patterns um, but there's certainly no reason why you couldn't use those squares for afghans and that kind of thing so definitely one to consider purchasing if you um, don't see one you know anything on this year's calendar that you like I believe she still also has the um, digital downloads of previous um, calendars and I did also notice on www.armyofwomen.org that you can donate directly so um, a very worthy cause and I thought I would mention that one so thank you Cindy for writing to me and um, I hope that I've been able to get that out there for enough people for you okay so that's that um, I'm going to tick off today my um, show notes and then I'll have a bit more of a idea what we've done and what we haven't done okay so the next point I wanted to raise was comments from episode 15 thanks guys um, I know that I, I I'm always kind of a bit concerned when I mention um, my panic attacks the fertility treatment that I'd been on the miscarriage and things like that and I'm aware that you know some people might find that uncomfortable um, I completely understand and sometimes that kind of makes me think well, should I mention it should I not but you know this is a podcast about me about my business so I kind of think you know if if you want if you're happy to listen to it then it's something that I'll mention infrequently it's not you know I don't go on about it all the time but um, if it's something you're uncomfortable with then usually I only talk about it for a couple of minutes so you can easily skip past it or skip that episode if you want to um, but I was really surprised after mentioning, um, not surprised really, because I know you guys are, are always really good at you know getting in touch and just dropping in and saying hi and chatting every so often. Um, but I, I guess I didn't really comprehend how many people I'd sort of touched by mentioning the whole panic attack um, issue that I've, I've been suffering with recently. So I had um, quite a few um, emails, phone calls, people come up to me at shows um, and contacts of, of all different kinds for people who suffer panic attacks themselves or people who have suffered panic attacks but sort of learned to live with them or learned to in a way control um, the sort of or, or take steps if you like that lead to this sort of anxiety driven attack um, and sort of have, have learnt to overcome or prevent these symptoms if you like um, and that's been really great so I'm going to put in the show notes um, a couple of links um, first of all to a website that I was recommended that had some information about panic attacks on that and um, also to um, an ebook that I actually found um, on iTunes you probably can find it on the web as well so you might be able to um, download it on other Android devices, maybe even through Amazon um, on the Kindle Fire. Um, <coughs> sorry, take a drink. Very dry today. Mm. And also, I found um, an iPhone app which has actually been quite helpful. Um, I it's one of those relaxation um, sort of hypnosis techniques and you sort of play it, I mean I choose to play it about 5-10 minutes before I go to bed so that sort of helps me unwind because that for me is when I tend to panic um, at night I guess I tend to um, my mind tends to not slow down and relax enough so when I go to sleep I don't really get a full night's sleep and it sort of crescendos into an attack um, so I'll include those in the show notes for anyone who might be interested um, and you know, thank you once again for all of your support and, and kind comments because that really means a lot. It really, really does, and I can't thank you enough for that. So um the next thing I wanted to mention was Christmas post days. Now I'm gonna read this direct from my website. Um I know it's only November the fifth, but um unfortunately, um some of those closing dates for last recommended post days to get your items before Christmas are coming up 
so I wanted to make sure I mention those. They all start in December, but I know that I probably won't podcast until the second week of December and I will have missed some of them, so it's perfect timing to start mentioning those now. So if you're sending to the British forces, if you are sending to anybody who is an operational British force, then you really need to send your items before the 30th of November to go and, well, I say these are guarantees by Royal Mail, but we know what Royal Mail's like. The slight chance of snow, the slight chance of leaves on the track like British Rail and Royal Mail tend to have to suffer delays and delays and delays. Um, so I'm going to suggest to you this. If I give you a date, order at least two, three weeks before if you can, and that way you're more likely to get what you need before Christmas rather than being disappointed. So I'm going to give you these final dates, so bear these final dates in mind, but make sure you order a couple of weeks, two or three weeks in advance of these dates, okay? And then that way I can hope to get things to you in good time for Christmas. So if you're operational British forces, 30th of November. If you're a static British force, then your last day of order is um, the 14th of December. Um, international airmail, which is which includes all of the insured services as well as standard airmail, which is what I mostly use. So if you're in Asia, Australia or the Far East, including Japan and New Zealand, um, it's the 5th of December. If you're in Africa, the Caribbean, Central and South America and the Middle East, then you're looking at the 7th of December. If you're in Eastern Europe, Canada and the USA, then the 10th of December, Western Europe, the 12th of December. Inland, UK. For second class and recorded, you want the 18th of December as your final order date. First class and recorded, the 20th of December. Special delivery Saturday guarantee has to be the 21st of September, of December rather, not September. And special delivery is the 22nd of December. So if you could bear those in mind, as I say, order two or three weeks in advance of those and you're pretty much going to be guaranteed to get your items and not be disappointed with any Royal Mail delays shortly before Christmas. I will be open until 11am um, on the 21st of December. So up until that date you can order from me and call me and email me and I will respond. Um, after that date, between the 21st and the 2nd of January, which I come back to work at 9am, um, I will be unavailable by contact via email and phone. Of course you can continue ordering from the main website, I will close down my Etsy store, but you can buy from Um and you can send me um, as many you know, sort of emails, questions as you like, but I won't respond to you or process any of those orders until I get back on the 2nd of January. I've decided this year I'm going to be a bit more sort of tough on myself with, um, with you know, my sort of approach to work. I, in the past, well, probably the past couple of years, I think over the last couple of years I've probably taken a couple of weeks off which is outside of the time I had off for um, when I was in hospital and recovering from um, operations. Um, so I didn't really have any quality time off so I'm going to and I'm going to refer to this giant wall chart of written in mess. Yeah look at it. God! Already! It's the 5th of November and already I think I've filled every single possible day with a show or something. Um, I've still got a few shows in that coming in and I've still applied for a few more shows that I won't find out about until a bit later on this year or beginning of next. But that, it's pretty much full up as you can see. So I've written in um, four weeks of holiday and I actually plan to take them this year. Um, the reason why I plan to take them, aside from just needing a bit of personal space, is because I've actually packed a bit more work in to those working weeks. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, very dry today. Um, let's see. Yeah, I've got Fleece Club going ahead again next year, and there might be a mini 
um, breed club that sits alongside that for anybody who doesn't want to handle um, raw fleece. I know that some people have allergies. I also know that some people overseas will have trouble getting any raw product through customs. So for you, I'm going to try and develop a breed club that will run alongside fleece club. Not sure entirely how that's going to work yet. I'm still you know, working on the ideas, but when I talk about development a little bit later on, um, we can talk about that some more and see, you can kind of get an idea of what I have in my mind of how that's going to work already. So I have that coming. I have two fibre clubs booked for next year. One will open in January and the other one later in the year, um, which probably coincide with about the same time that this year's club um, worked. Also, I'm going to have a monthly back club as well. So there's going to be lots more for you to see, join in on, enjoy, um, opportunities to purchase. There are some new shows, there are also some workshops as well, which I um, I kind of hadn't anticipated, but have sort of come from contacts, people I've met, shows and things like that. So that's quite interesting. I'll probably speak about that a bit more um, a bit later on, but um, yeah, I kind of feel that I'm going to need those four weeks off, so I'm going to be tough with myself. And I already have plans for one of those holidays, but a bit more about that closer to uh, when the time comes round. So, I guess what is is going to be um, good to talk about now is the shop update. Um, I did the shop update on Friday, which was the 2nd of November, and already some of the items have sold, but I thought I would run through some of the bits that are left just so that you can see um, some of the items a bit more closely, because um, I know that that helps sometimes online. The pictures can only be so good, so it'll give you a better idea if I give you a, a show and tell. So let's start. I'm going to start by inserting a picture here. and let's go through those products. So I'm going to lean out of view, so apologies for that. Um, I'm going to reach for a box. Now, these are the remaining bats that I have left from the shows, and there were only four of the um, 60 or 70 that we made. We've only got four left, so that's pretty good. So um, they are all around 30 grams, probably just over, and they're 335 each, and they are my limited edition bits and pieces. So here's one, and hopefully you can see there, there really is colourful with lots of different bits and pieces of texture. So in this one we've got, on a Shetland base, we've got Corridale and Merino, um, with bamboo staple and sari silk. So the bamboo staple is the white bit here and the sari silk is all this sort of colourful texture sitting on, on the top of that. I've got another option of that um, which is quite similar. It doesn't have um, sari silk, it's just two sari silk in that one. Um, so a different effect on spinning but they work quite nicely together if you wanted two that are quite similar. Then I've got um, a more rainbow one, and this has got some curls in it, you can see. So this one is Dorset Horn with Merino Corridale Bamboo Staple, Hand Dyed Gotland and Tease Water Curls. Sounds nice. And this is the last one which is a Shetland base with Corridale Merino and Sari Silk and Bamboo Staple. So another rainbow option there for you. And these spin up really quite nicely. Um, if you want to know what to do with 30 grams, well, it depends really on what craft you're doing. If you are an embellisher, what I would say is I would use it for a, either a top layer of fibre. Um, you can either tease out bits and pieces to work into the surface of your textile or you can use it as a complete surface and just needle felt it down in certain areas, bead onto it, embellish onto it. Um, God, 
but you could do all sorts with it. Um, if you're needle felting, again, you can use it as one whole layer or just tease bits and pieces from it, and the same with wet felting. Um, if you're wet felting and if you're needle felting, if you come across, say, a section of bamboo staple or a section of sari silk, then just make sure you catch those bits down with a bit more of the 100% um, wool. Um, because it's the wool that will felt as opposed to the, the plant and the silk fibres so you need to make sure that they catch in. If you're spinning, um, this will create beautiful um, single ply um, yarn. Again, you could ply it against itself or you could ply it against a solid colour which will give you a different effect still. Um, I tend to find with bats that you get a very textured feel to your single so you'll get lumps and bumps, thick and thin pieces but actually that's kind of what I'm trying to encourage. Um, I am Sarah's texture craft, so I am trying to encourage you to think about textural spinning and things. So these are really ideal for that because it gives you lots of opportunity to um, create all sorts of wonderful things. Um, from 30 grams, I, in the past I've done small headbands if I've just plied it against itself, but if you ply it um, against a solid colour. There's no reason why you couldn't use it for, say, trimming on a hat. I know that I do have a customer who's about to do that with one of hers. Um, you could use it for um, decorations, um, like sort of crocheted flowers and things like that on a hat, or you could use it to make wrist warmers, perfect time of year for wrist warmers. Um, and so on. So they're quite versatile and they're um, quite an interesting way to spin. So that's those. And then I'm going to just reach out the shot again. Yawn. Yes, I have some hand spun yarns. Um, I know that the website and my Etsy shop have been quite low on hand spuns, so I wanted to get as much done for the October shows as I could so that hopefully I would have had some left over to um, put onto the website and give you some new stock. It didn't kind of work out like that because most of what I made went straight out which is always the way it goes and of course I'm quite grateful for it to, to go like that. Um, it does mean that I'm going to be spinning like crazy in the evenings I think to try and get a little bit more on the um, website and on the, Etsy sh on the Etsy shop but until then these are just the yarns remaining from, from the new batch on my website. So I'm going to start with this one. This is called Fire Opal. This is my hand-dyed blue face Lester and it's spun against um, a Lurex thread. So it gives you a, a sort of goldy twist against those orange and peach and yellow colours. Um, it's lovely and soft. It is 120 grams and you get 279 metres for that. Um, and that's 18 pounds. So quite a nice amount there to do um, some really nice special pieces, maybe something for Christmas for somebody. The next one I've got is Spiced Chocolate. This is a hand dyed Falkland against hand dyed Shetland. Um, it's 50-50 because one ply is Falkland, one ply is Shetland. I've got 108 grams at 162 metres which retails for 16.90. Um, and I love this colour. It, you've got all these sort of russet oranges against those sort of mossy greeny yellows and real better chocolate browns. So that would make a lovely cowl or a hat or something like that. Gorgeous. And really soft as well. I mean you don't always expect that from, from like Shetland. I'm particularly um, spinning from just a natural fibre. Sometimes it well it does, it feels a lot more coarse cool than say a merino or a brew face Leicester which I know are very popular but actually once they're knitted up and they're washed Shetland has a really beautiful hand feel to it um, this one is strawberry chocolate this is 50% Shetland and 50% merino the merino is um, strawberry shortcake which is one of the blends that I used to do under my limited edition range and I had a little bit of that left over and I was like, ooh, I wonder what that would look like against my bitter chocolate Shetland. 
So I spun that up and because the merino has got um, some chocolate within the colour as well you get these really lovely sections. I'll show you a bit there where it's it's sort of different colours of, of chocolate then you've got like a vanilla and strawberry colour and it's so so soft. That's 148 grams which gives you 224 metres at £22.20. So really squishy stuff, lovely. And then this is the final one, which was very cooed after and, um, yeah, really loved. I mean, everyone picked this up and was like, oh, my God, this is beautiful. But I just, you know, I've, I've just got so much in my stash at the moment. Um, and I've had a lot of people asking, you know, when will it be up on the site? When will it be up on the site? You know, I'm going to save it to my favourites. Well, it is up on the site now. Um, I'm going to have a second skein of this which will be ever so slightly different because obviously all hand dyes come up slightly different but um, this is 198 grams of 50% Corridale and 50% Merino so one ply Corridale, one ply hand dyed Merino the yardage is um, 256 metres and that is £29.70 and it's called Oceanic and you get um, the Corridale that I've used is the Corridale that I stock on the website that I've got in the sale at the moment. So if you wanted to spin up yourself, I would choose that one. And then the Merino Hand Dyed is some leftover um, colour that I had, I think from a retail order. Um, one of the customers had two or three different sort of greeny blue shades and this one just didn't quite come out as I wanted it to. So I decided to keep it for spinning because of course... Um, you know, apply it against another colour and it suddenly becomes something completely different um, and as you can see it really does work against that blue Corridale and you get all of these sort of greens and light blues mixing together and, and it's going to be really nice knitted up um, and I think you could probably get a little shawlette out of that it's quite thick so you would need chunky needles and I'm pretty sure you could get something that would just cover the shoulders for that or at least a cowl that came and covered the shoulders. Um, yeah, lovely. Very soft. So that's pretty much what I've got to um, to show you from the last shop update. I know there were a few other things um, in that shop update. Um, I've still got some of them left. Things like um, bigger backpacks. I had some knops. Um, I've still got a couple of um, the hand dyed yarns. Um, Moata silk and the Moata silk and the silk rods, um, they are all up for sale. I've got a small selection of product up for sale on Etsy that I did at the same time, but the majority of it you'll find on the website, which is sarahstexturecrafts.com. So that was the shop update. In the next shop update, I am looking um, to have a lot more hand dyed. It's just been um, impossible to really get anything um, together after the shows um, which I guess leads me nice and neatly to the October show reviews um, back at ooh, the second weekend of October it was the 13th and 14th of October I was at the Woolly House weekend which was hosted by Sophia at Kelly House um, a beautiful uh, stately home that's um, it hosted Woolly Weekend and I guess there was about 12, 14, 15 maybe stall holders there and it was really good actually because everybody was so different even though um, we were all very wool orientated um, a lot of us had spinning and knitting products we all had our own kind of niche if you like you know there were felt makers there there were people who just dealt in yarn, there were quilt makers there, there was a lady who sold the most fabulous buttons and shawl pins and things that she made from polymer clay and she had other products that she used the polymer clay on as well like um, using them for buttons on the front of journals um, so they could have that sort of button over closure really really gorgeous stuff and as I say everybody was so different that despite the fact that it wasn't a huge show so you know you didn't get thousands and thousands of people there everyone still did quite well 
Um, it was a really good turnout and considering we'd had as much rain as we had and the um, Kelly house is, is quite out of the way really. A lot of people came and you know and made the effort to come and, and say hi to me or to the other stall holders that they'd heard about the show from and it was a really really great atmosphere so I really enjoyed that. It was the first time we'd done that show so we really weren't quite sure what to expect so I was absolutely thrilled to come home with several empty boxes and of course quite scared at the same time because most of that empty box or empty boxes were the space where I had hand dyed braids so I had to run around like a mad thing the next week to try and get enough hand dyed together dyed and dried within a week for the Somerset Guild which was on the 20th of October um, that was just a morning event for me, although they normally meet for the whole day. But they had a, a speaker in the afternoon who was really, really interesting. I completely forget her name. Awful. Um, but she was fantastic. She, um, I was only there for part of the meeting. Um, I had originally planned to, you know, sort of do my stuff, do my thing, and then go so that I, you know, wouldn't disrupt her talk. But actually, as it turned out. Um, my, over, my overly successful morning caused us delays on the way home and several reasons for that. First of all, um, did really well on the stall so thank you, thank you to everybody who um, went that day and, and who also supported me that day. It was really good to see you all again and say hi and um, show you some of the new bits and pieces that I was doing. Um, so it took me well, it didn't take me too long to um, to put things back in the boxes because I ended up with empty boxes again. Um, but the issue was um, I was partly on my own for the last bit, so it was it was kind of making sure I wasn't packing up too soon and and you know disrupting sales, but at the same time trying to sort of get everybody through quickly enough so I didn't upset the the lady who was who was coming in to speak after me by encroaching on her time. Um, the reason why I was on my own is because Darren um, kindly went home with a new loom that I purchased. Yes, like I need another table loom. Um, I do have a table loom myself. I have an Ashford. Um, because I'm supplied by Ashford, that was the kind of obvious choice. Um, because A, it would give me an opportunity to um, have a go with it, understand it, so I know what I'm selling a bit more also learn about all the different parts and bits and pieces and that and also because to be honest I get it at wholesale value so why wouldn't I take the opportunity to buy brand new there so I came across this loom at um, the Somerset Guild and um, I was talking away to somebody and I was actually I think I was I think I was off to purchase tickets for the raffle prize um, Anyway, we got chatting and um, the lady said to me, well, are you interested in buying a loom? And I said, well, how, you know, how much is it? And she said, £20. Uh, jaw hits the floor, you know, I'm fainting with like, oh my God, £20. You know, £20 for a table loom. I mean, OK, it was a very old table loom and it does um, need some work, some repair. But £20? I mean, normally you see the same thing for like £70, £80. So I said, right, OK. Let me just think about that for a second. £20. Even if, because I can get all of the parts wholesale from Ashford, even if I get those, I could resell it for £70 if I wanted to. And make like maybe a tenner for my efforts. Um, so I thought, well, that's point one, the reason why I should get this today. And secondly, I actually know somebody very close to me who, um, who's always talked about learning to weave. And I thought, oh, this is an opportunity to buy this for Christmas. Do it up. If this person doesn't take to it, I can then, you know, get rid of it on their behalf, if you like, by putting it on the stall at Wonderwall next year or whatever. Um, so all round you can't really refuse a table loom for £20 and I couldn't believe that it had been sat there for the majority of the morning and nobody 
had thought to to buy it or see it. I mean, I I just assumed that the loom was part of the guild equipment because most guilds will have their own equipment, normally carders, that kind of thing. Um, so I just assumed it was part of their equipment and somebody had returned it for the day or it was to be collected by the next person on the list who was going to borrow it and take it home, you know. So to get it for £20 was just unbelievable. So I was like, Darren, please, <laughs> will you go home and do me this favour, take this with you and then come back for me a bit later. Um, so bless him, he did. Um, and I have the loom in my possession. So I'm, I've been working on it. I've um, replaced the heddles. What else have I done? Um, I've got a new raddle for it. I've also replaced the um, wiring that goes up from the sheds to the toggle, the, the sort of pulley toggles. Um, so I've replaced all of that and I'm hoping that should be about it now. Um, I've had to buy new um, sticks for it. Um, and then I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to warp it up and give it to this person ready warped so all they've got to do is actually weave with it. Then if they like that process and find it interesting enough to do a tabby weave and the variations you can do from a tabby weave setup, um, then I will show them how to um, you know, slay the reeds and all of that by setting up the loom. Um, for a second project for them so quite excited quite excited I'm very excited actually so that was my day really um, the only other thing I have to mention from the Somerset Guild was I um, oh, it wasn't there I won the raffle now I, I normally I don't win raffles and things like that so I was um, really like off to chips to hear my name come up you know um, but at the same time I was quite embarrassed because um, John Arben had come in and he's now the president of the Somerset Guild and he owns um, a mill here in the southwest um, and he produces combed tops right through to yarn right through to his own line of alpaca socks and things so he brought along X amount of a super fine merino it was that he was going to split into bundles as raffle prizes um, and everyone was really really excited about this you know it was like wow you know I'm going to have lots of plain fibre to dye and you know I've got to get my raffle tickets in and there was so much excitement when my number came up when there was one of those lots um, bumps of fibre still available and they were like oh Sarah you know come come grab your bump of fibre I just thought yeah, I feel really guilty because, obviously, who wouldn't turn down a bump of fibre, but at the same time, not being a member of the Guild and just being a guest on the day, I thought it was, I don't know, it felt a bit rude to take, you know, like one of the top prizes. So what I said was, OK, um, I won't take that, put that back into the pot for somebody else, and I'll just take one of the other prizes. So I ended up coming away with a bottle of wine. I um, haven't consumed it yet, but um, maybe this weekend coming, because it's my birthday, this coming weekend. So um, that'd be quite nice, something to look forward to. Um, get a nice meal together, bottle of wine, yeah. Sounds like fun. Um, so yeah, I won this bottle of wine, so I was quite surprised. Um, so Darren was all pleased when um, when he got back and realised that I you know, got, got some free bottle of wine as well. <laughs> um, I think we were, where were we due the next day? Oh, the 21st we were at KTOG 6, which is a small knitting event. Sorry about that, a quick break in the show. I realised after I'd rambled on and signed off the show and wanted to start editing that actually my phone had run out of battery. So, sorry about that. Here is second take <laughs> um, and let's get back to talking about KTOG 6. KTOG 6 is um, a small event um, here in the southwest that's been run annually in around September, October each year over the last six years. Um, last year was the first year that I um, attended the show as a vendor. Um, last year I think there was about seven, eight, maybe nine of us there. Um, myself and various other storeholders. There were also um, 
a, a ruffle stool, a white elephant, um, a few of the um, the the people who were helping um, to organise the show had um, little stalls where they would sell you know bits and pieces like project bags they made that kind of thing, um, stitch markers, and so on. Um, and there were also little um, areas that were like drop-in workshops if you like so you could learn how to use a card there how to spin or spin you could learn how to knit that kind of thing um which is really great as a as a small sort of community show um and lots of people traveled to it um late on the saturday night on the uh I, I say late i was on my way home from the somerset guild on the 20th of october when i got a call from terry the organizer who said I hope you're still on for tomorrow, um, show's still going ahead, it will be one to five, um, but you will be the only stall holder because um, for various reasons other people have dropped out, so I hope that you still want to come, um, to which I said well yeah, you know, I've, I've put my name down for it, I've paid my my stall money and um, so, you know, I've, I've got the stock so why not? Um, I mean, there are always, um, you know, sort of two ways of looking at that situation. You can either say, well, um, you know, it, it's maybe not worth me. Um, sorry, that was my computer. I'll just turn the sound off. It's probably not worth me turning up, um, you know, because people might hear that there's only one stall holder or they might come in and see there's only one stall holder and, and sort of leave quite quickly rather than spending any money. Um, or you could go, well, actually, I've committed to it, so I've got the stock, I'll go do it, and, and you never know, it might be quite successful because I'm the only stall holder there. Um, so I mean, I took that route because I thought, you know, well, it would only be rude at this stage to drop out. Um, also, I did okay at the show last year, so if we get the same kind of people turning up, then there's no reason to say I shouldn't be able to take the same amount again and try my best um, to take a little bit more maybe. Um, as it turns out, I think last year it was it was all day on the Sunday. Was it Saturday? No, it was just one day and it was all day, whereas this year it was just one to five. Um, I think there were fewer people who came through the door as a result and it was a much smaller venue because um, there were less stall holders. Um, but, you know, um, they were, the organisers were there, they were very good, they, you know, I could have had as much space, or as little space as I wanted, um, help unpacking the car, unpacking stuff, you know, I needn't have lifted a finger, really, they were, you know, they couldn't do enough to help. Um, but, you know, it was, it was absolutely fine. Um, the, enough people came in that I made my stall money back, um, plus a little bit extra. Um, it was a fun day, caught up with a few familiar faces, um, you know, chatting, that kind of thing. And, you know, it, it's it's one of those afternoons that actually you don't mind if if it does if you don't make as much money as you would do at a regular show. Um, because it was a nice event, it was a nice atmosphere and it had that community feel to it. I entered the raffle there and I think it must have been my lucky weekend because my name came up again. Um, so I got, and I'll just reach out of shop, a copy of Fitted Knitter, which is, sorry, Fitted Knits, which is 25 designs for the fashionable knitter by Stephanie Chappelle. And um, I, I don't really tend to be a larger project person. Um, up until now I have really stuck to doing smaller things, so hats, scarves, cowls, um, the odd pair of fingerless mitts, but generally smaller things. Um, I've done a couple of sweaters, but they've been very basic. Well, I'm going to knit a couple of rectangles and sew them together for the body and then some more rectangles for the arms. And I don't mind what it looks like because it's going to be around the house sweater, so it's fine. Um, so getting this book has actually made me think, well, you do know what, um, it might actually be worth me rethinking that um, that whole not being a sweater knitter. And now I've got the tools to create maybe the, the knits that I would actually like to wear. So brilliantly, um, it normally retails for, um, I haven't got a UK price on it. I've got a US price of $22.99 and a Canadian price of $27.99. I'm assuming that it, it um, retails here in the UK. If not, I'm pretty sure that you'd be able to find it on Amazon. 
in fact I'm pretty sure I've seen it on Amazon um, so yeah I mean I'll, I'll let you know as and when I use it and how I find it so yay I won another thing <laughs> Um, and then the, the final show was um, the West Country Embroiderers Guild, which was on the 27th of October. That was a one day show, but really the potential to sell is about three hours long. Um, each of the members arrive in the day around 10, 20 past 10, um, and they go, you know, they might have a quick whiz round and see who the stallholders are. Again, there was only. There was only five of us um, in limited space. Um, I was quite lucky. I I um, I got there and um, I, I got a spot that was different to the spot that I had last year and actually worked out much better for for my stock. So really pleased with that. Um, and as I say, people generally come in, they do a quick quiz round and have a look and see um, what stall holders are there, what products they might be interested in buying. Then they go into their meeting. They're in there until lunchtime, by which time I think they are all ready to spend those pennies because you hear um, a round of applause, then you hear the doors being opened by you know, one of the organisers, and then you hear rustling of bags, and then there's this steady and even pace of people taking steps down the auditorium steps to, to get to the door and suddenly this turns into almost like a running speed and around the corner is this mass of women um, just s slowly sort of, you know, okay, I'm at the front of the queue here, you know, elbow, you know, jumbo sale elbows coming out, you know, no, I've seen that, I've got to go and get it first, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's like a stampede and they just launch themselves down this hallway at you and, and you're you're in awe of these of this mass of women coming towards you. Um and and that's it, they just descend and it's chaos. It's absolute chaos for the entire lunch hour until about two o'clock when they go back in um to listen to their afternoon talk. Um and I have to say they really did me proud. Um, they Im totally embraced all of um, my hand dyed, whether it be braids, um, yarn, hand spun yarn, they adored, they bought up all of my bats, so that, which is why I've only got four remaining. They um, consumed um, a few dyed fleeces worth of fibre as well. I had Blue Face Leicester curls and Gotland curls and they both just went. I had um, a very small amount of the Gotland left at the end of the day. Um, and then I guess about five to two that was it, They it was, it was quiet and all of the store holders just sort of sat down on their chairs and were like wow, <laughs> my god, you know, have a, it was, it was an opportunity to, you know, have a quick sip of your, your juice and, or a cup of tea and, um, wait for them to come back out at the end of the day. I actually took the opportunity to go in and listen to the talk. Um, it was a really, really good talk and um, really made me um, so inspired by the idea of getting back into doing a bit more sort of textile based fibre work. Um, I mean, up until now, I've mostly been spinning. Um, that's really kind of been my, my passion spinning and then knitting the yarn over this last sort of year or so. And after that particular talk, it really made me want to get back into um, doing sort of flat textile pieces of wool. Um, so one of the customers there mentioned to me a book by Moy McKay and it's called Art in Felt and Stitch and this is it. So I've got myself a copy so um, I've been flicking through and she was saying um, what she particularly you know, wanted me to have a look at was the colour set up of the landscapes and things like that from this particular artist because it's so um, sort of um, she she sort of saw it as um, like an influence um, in, in her personal work and then when she saw my bats and the way the, the colours were worked into the bats she immediately 
went back to this artist's um, work and her mind and was thinking, oh, I could do, you know, pieces that look like this or, you know, the cover piece and so on and, and work with, with a product that was made for her where she might not feel as confident creatively to be able to produce that herself, that, you know, that sort of that work herself. So that was... Um, yeah really really kind of um an inspiring conversation and a, a real yeah kind of ego boost i guess because um you know here was she likening my work to some artist who had a who's, who's got a work in print you know i mean that's hugely flattering so um it was super um thrilled to have that conversation with her so thank you so much <laughs> you know who you are um, so I had to get myself a copy and, and see what it was all about. So I'm, I'm going to be looking into that and maybe um, working on a few pieces from that. But it's, it's a really good detailed book and she takes you right through the steps of how each um, sort of project is made. So she starts right down from the layering of fibres, the choice of fibres, how to blend fibres, how she would set her backgrounds and so on and then how she... Um, wet felts that and needle felts elements of more detail and interest into it and then she hands it hand embellishes on top of that adds beads that kind of thing and it's really kind of up my street because it's full of all of those textural elements that I love so I'm looking forward to that and hopefully over this next month or so now that I've got a few weekends to myself you never know I might get a little time to do a little something even if it's just a small experimental piece then that would be quite nice coming soon <laughs> and so yeah my next show will be the end of January in West Point where, where I will be doing craft for crafters which is a huge huge show for me um, and quite an expense as well so a little bit worried about that but um I don't know I mean I think I've, I've got a fair few customers in this end of the country and um, the southwest end and I know that a lot of people are quite prepared to travel to these bigger shows so I'm hoping that um, there will be enough customers interested in learning how to felt or spin or you know use wool fibre for embellishing that kind of thing um, who knows it's, it's something you've got to try right <laughs> um, so that's it for shows um, I guess the last thing I wanted to talk about really was um, the idea of business change. Um, it's this time of year where in between packing orders for the um, for the shop on the run up to Christmas that I try to think about um, development and try to do a little bit of development and um, I've also been approached by quite a few companies now who would like me to offer wholesale. Um, with my pricing structure at the moment there just is no margin there is absolutely no margin to to make a wholesale offer um, so what I'd like to do from January is, is to essentially do one thing that will kill two birds with one stone if you like I will be raising prices um, slightly above um, general cost increases next year so for things like on the hand dyed tops, they're currently £4.75 for 100 grams of hand dyed top. Um, now, I know that you know the majority of, of people at the same quality level, their minimum charge for hand dyed top is £8 for 100 grams. So I know that you know I'm half price. I'm very, very reasonable. Um, so I will be increasing my hand dyed top price by a pound. So you're looking at five seventy five for next year. I'm saying that in November, not having obviously any knowledge of how much um, the cost prices will go up next year. So I'm I'm saying that will be you know a price increase, but you know there may be a, a plus or minus. Um, factor to that depending on what the prices come in and probably at the end of January I'll get all the new prices in so at the beginning of February I'll set up my new prices on the website and for 100 grams of hand dyed top you'll be looking at 575 which I think you'll agree is still 
um, very good value for money. Um, but it also means that then I will be able to say, right, okay, at the moment I cannot give those wholesale customers a huge discount, but if they buy a set amount, then I can give you this money off and do it like that. So, um, two birds, one stone, if you like. Um, price increases won't be that dramatic across the board. Commercial products will go up incrementally as well, they haven't done in the last few years. I've tried to rem keep the majority of items, particularly the merino, um, the same. But um, it's becoming an untenable position to maintain those prices anymore just because I've maintained them for a few years. So they will increase um, by the increment they should increase this year. Um, that will still put me under recommended retail price, but um, you know, so you'll still be getting a better offer. But there will be an increase, um, but it won't be as much as, say, on the hand eye tops, that kind of thing. Um, also, with this, um, by the beginning of February and hopefully by the end of March, I will have um, a new collection in. So I will have a 2013 Sarah's Texture Crafts collection. That will encompass a new range of um, hand eye colours, uh, an extension to the semi-solid coloured range, plus basic fibres. I will also have um, new bat offerings. They will probably change in size as well. I'm going to try and increase them from 30 grams to 50 grams per bat. So you can do a lot more with your bat. The limited edition bats probably will also increase in size. And the price, I'm not looking to increase the price too much, but the price will be incrementally more expensive, but it will be at the same rate, if you like, as per gram as the as the 31 will, or at least only a tiny bit more, depending on how the, the new prices come in from suppliers. Um, what else will I include? Uh, I will have a more... Um, cohesive range of hand dyed yarns. Up until now my hand dyed yarns have been very sporadic because they've always been just an add-on to, to fibres and things and fibre has really been my main focus. That's where the majority of my customer base is but I do realise that there is a market now for my hand dyed yarns so I'm going to try my best to be a bit more um, on the ball with that and keep that going. Um, I now have a much better supplier of yarns so I know that I can get the bases, so it's really worth putting in the time and the effort to get that collection together. So that's what I'm going to do for you as well. What else am I going to do? There's going to be a few <coughs> um, new products. I'm still researching the finer details, looking at packaging, that kind of thing, but hopefully they will be available by the end of March. Um, so yes, next year, January is the month to shop at old prices. I always do that every January. It's like my January sale, if you like, um, because I can't offer huge discounts of like 50% off this and 50% off that. What I do is I keep my January prices um, static to the 2012 rate. And then that way you can say that you've saved money with me buying in January. Um, February new price range, by the end of March you will have the 2013 collection which will run right through till the end of March 2014 most probably. There will be the Fleece Club, um, two fibre clubs, uh, a monthly bat club. The monthly bat club will be a 50 gram bat, it will be based on a colour theme and I will just ad hoc put 10 spots up. Um, if I sell out of those quickly and there's higher demand on a particular month then I will stock more um, spots. I will probably eke those out between the website and Etsy, probably 50-50 to start with just to see where the market is. If I end up getting more orders via Etsy for that particular product then I'll always have more spots available on Etsy than I will on the website but you know, if, if you're really desperate to, to be in that club, there will be um, new spots open every month. I'm not going to do it as a subscription club because I know that 
let's face it, particularly starting from January, money is going to be tight for most of us. So I want to make sure that you are only buying into the months that you want to buy into. So you can buy January, then you might not wish to buy anything until April, and so on and so forth. Um, but once those spots go up, and I think I've got them. Yeah, I'm going to put them on the first or second Thursday of every month, around the sort of seventh, eighth, ninth. Um, yeah, of every month. And um, as I say, as soon as those 10 spots have closed, unless I have a huge demand for an amount more, then there won't be any more spots until the next month's club open. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. Because um, I've, I've had lots of people say yes, they would be interested, but I know that it's all going to be dependent on what colour pops up and so on. So we'll play it much by ear and, and go from there. Um... I'm also going to be doing a few more workshops and visits. I haven't done any workshops actually since um, I moved down here just because I hadn't had the space, couldn't find the venue and I didn't have the option of tapping into London resources. And the last time I taught was at Ali Pali, um, probably about four years ago now. Um, so 2013 I'm looking to try and do a few workshops locally um, using other people's um, venues and tapping into their class database resources. So the first one will be, um, I think it's the second week of January or third week, I think it's it's the 16th of January. Um, it's an evening 8 till 10 p.m. and that's with the Craft Hub. Um, they do a monthly pub night um, where they get together um, you have a drink, um, you meet your friends, and you learn a new craft for that day. Um, I'm going to be doing needle felting with those. I will repeat the same class at the WI, um, where I'll be doing it as a demo more than a drop-in workshop. Um, that will be for the WI in July. I can probably also offer that same workshop if you have a desire to have me come to a local venue. Um, I did when I when I first moved down here I did hire a hall to host a needle felting workshop and at the last minute everybody dropped out. I mean fortunately for me um when it came to the hire of the hall um because the venue um the Crenaton Arts Centre um you know wanted a, lo a lot more people to make use of the hall they gave me the first booking for free so I didn't actually lose anything but the problem was it then didn't give me the confidence to try again. Um, you know, I can't, I'm just too small to be paying for premises if people aren't going to show up. So um, what I'm doing now is I'm going to sort of make myself available as a visiting teacher, if you like. Um, I don't claim to be, you know, the be-all and end-all of, of needle felt or anything like that, the font of all knowledge or anything like that. Um, I just love what I do and you know I mean, this is the kind of thing that I make um, I've also made um, potted gardens that kind of thing um, and so if you're happy to learn a few techniques from me I'm happy to show them to you uh, I'm also as I say available for visits as well so I'm going to be in March at, back at the Somerset Guild where I'm actually going to do a sort of um, introduction to Sarah's Texture Crafts if you like um, a bit about me, how I got started, the products that I use. I know that most of you already know me, um, but it will be quite nice to sort of reach out and, and make sure that everybody who, who visits there know why you know I'm there occasionally or, or who I was when I turned up back in October. So um, that could be quite interesting. Um, and again, I'm available to do that for other local guilds. Um, and just generally, I think 2013 is, is going to be my opportunity to sort of really get going with this brand now that business is sort of, um, it's starting to progress in, in the way that I had always hoped it would. Um, and certainly in this last year, making having made the particular changes that I have, like I, I dropped working on eBay because of their silly policies and so on. Um, 
and also the way they expected me to treat customers which fell short far short of, of what I deem as basic customer service. Uh, I also stopped selling on Amazon um, just because their fees were just becoming ridiculous. Um, so it's also quite difficult on there because the way they've set up um, if you've ever tried to sell anything on Amazon, the way they've tried to set it up now is that you can see immediately what the other price, what the cheapest price for that particular product is. So, in most cases, to go in and match that price at least, I would have to be taking a drop in all of the margin that is available on that particular product because most of these companies that are selling are so huge, they're getting stuff direct from factories for pennies, whereas I'm paying pounds. So it gets to a point where I'm, you know, was close to just giving stuff away and, you know, here, take this and some money, you know. So I, I had to stop that. I um, I also stopped selling on Folksy just because it was just too small for me. I spent more time on there taking stuff out of stock and putting stuff back into stock than I actually did selling. Um, now that the website is doing much better... Um, and, and Etsy also does very well for me it kind of makes sense to concentrate on those more you can still find my stuff on Dwanda um, which is a German website um, again very little sales on there so I'm, I'm contemplating as to whether that's something I continue with in 2013 we shall see um, I don't want to close everything down and just be left with my website and Etsy um, but now that I'm doing more shows, my, you know, my sort of ability to show off the brand, if you like, is sort of taking me in other directions. And it would be difficult at this stage to see a point where Duanda could become a, a growing concern within all of that, you know. And I don't want to take my eye off the ball and concentrate on something that's not doing so well for me when I need to make sure I'm focused on what works and expanding that offer and, and still making sure as, as a one-man band that I'm giving you 110% all the time, you know? So we shall see. Um, anyway, that's the sort of hint as to what 2013 will look like and um, I guess that's all I've got to say this time. So that's enough of me wittering on, as usual. <laughs> if you've stuck with me this far, then thank you so much for um, taking, you know, the time out of your day, I know time is precious, and um, for any new viewers, thank you for checking me out, and um, you know, I'd love to see you again next time. So until next time, I hope like me, you will dream lots more in fibre. Okay, cheers.